Honestly, I'm just proud of myself for not accidentally saying Oasis Kids because it's such a habit. But for anyone who I don't know yet, my name is Melissa. I get to serve as the Oasis Kids director here and also one of your student leaders on Thursdays. Um, and tonight we are going to be wrapping up the iconic panel, uh, iconic series. Um, so, so far we've been talking about who Jesus is and why he died, and tonight we're going to be going a little bit into um, what we do with all of that. But before we get into that, let's go ahead and pray. So dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for every single person here who has just come here to spend time together learning about you. Uh, thank you for who you are. Um, for sending your son for us and for your grace and your love and mercy that we do not deserve. Um, God, I pray for this service that you will use it, that you will speak through it, um, and then we all have open hearts and open minds to hear what you have to say. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So tonight we are going to be talking about two questions, and the first one is kind of a two-parter, um, and that is, what is a Christian and how do I know if I'm a Christian? Um, so, what is a Christian? Just shout it out. What does that even mean? Christ follower. Follower of Christ. Okay, so you all basically said like the exact same thing. It's like you all have one mind. That was crazy. Um, so, a Christian is a Christ follower. Kind of like um, Lewis and Pastor Alex have ta been talking about the past two weeks. It's someone who knows who Jesus is, who knows the gospel. But it's not just knowing who Jesus is. It's taking that a step further. Because even atheists know that Jesus was a man who existed. A Christ follower is someone who just takes it a little step further and accepts Jesus as their Savior who died on the cross for them and as the Lord of your life. But how do you really know if you're a Christian? Is there anyone who, and you can raise your hands, you have prayed that prayer of salvation and you have asked Jesus into your heart about a million times? Yeah, me too, exactly. So you just want to make sure that you, just to make sure that you did it right, just to be 100% sure, or if we're really being honest with ourselves, just to make sure that you're not going to hell. No shame in that. I've been there for sure. But here's the thing. Praying that prayer is not a magic button. If you, there's not any magic words that you have to say in the exact order and then poof, you are saved. And also, if you say that prayer but you don't actually mean it genuinely in your heart, it's not going to do anything for you either. Romans 10.10 10 says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So if you do those things, if you believe in your heart genuinely, and if you say it, then you are saved. And God doesn't want us to live in fear of whether or not we're saved. He doesn't want you to feel like you have to keep asking Jesus into your heart over and over and over again. He makes it very, very clear. In John 3.16, he tells us that anyone who believes is saved and has eternal life. And in John 10.29, he tells us that no one can snatch you out of his hand. Once you have done that, once you have made that decision and that commitment to him, you're saved. It doesn't matter what after that, nothing can take you away from God. Once you make that decision, you are saved. But it is not a one-time thing. It doesn't matter if you remember the exact date that you did that. It doesn't remember exactly how. All that matters is that it's a lifelong commitment. It's a continuous journey that you choose to take every single day with God. And it's not, being a Christian is not just a label. It's not something that's handed down to you from your parents. It is a real relationship with him. It means that you are striving every day to grow closer to him through things like studying his word, obeying his commandments, trying to become more like Jesus, allowing him to use you and mold you. It is a genuine relationship, not just something that you say you are. But again, how do you really know that you're a Christian? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. When you truly put your faith in Jesus, when you truly become a Christian, you are changed. It's not a checkbox. It's not a, all right, done that, I'm good, I am forgiven, so no matter what I do, I am good. I am going to go back to just doing whatever it is that I used to do. I'm going to keep going back to my old ways, do whatever I want. 
And if that is the thought process, then I would question, was that prayer really genuine? Do you really want to follow God? If you truly do, if you truly are a Christian, that means that you're changed. That means it's a dying to yourself every single day and waking up every single day choosing to live for him. And that changes everything. That changes how you think, how you act, how you love. It truly changes your entire life. And that doesn't mean that you are suddenly perfect, because that's definitely not even possible. It just means that you do your best to obey God, and that when you do fall short, you repent, you ask him for forgiveness, and you get up and you keep trying your best every single day to follow him. And that also doesn't make you better than anybody else. Being a Christian just makes you better than who you used to be. It means that you are constantly trying to grow and learn with him and pursue God. And know two stories of how you choose, of how you become a Christian, of how you make that decision to know God look exactly the same. So I have some help to demonstrate some of those stories. Um, everyone has a different testimony. Everyone has a different path of how they came to know God, of what their life looked like before and what their look, life looked like after. Um, so, get to hear some stories from some of the people that we spend time with every single Thursday. <laughs> So, our amazing, lovely panelists, could you just introduce yourself briefly and just say, um, just tell us a little bit about what your life looked like before you came to know God. Um, And everyone's looking at you, Manzi, so that means you're first. I grew up 
in a Catholic household, so growing up, everything kind of felt like a routine, just something that we do to do. My family went to church, but not really, and um, I didn't really develop a relationship with God until I actually started coming to Oasis, really. Um, that was probably when I was about 17, and I went to one of the camps, and you really feel the love of God, and you see everyone else um, accepting God as well, and developing their own relationship on a personal level, rather than everybody just doing it because it's something that we do. Um, so, yeah, I feel like now I can like stand firm knowing that Jesus is my savior, and what he did for me and everyone is something that should be held to a high standard and not just something that we look at as, oh yeah, he did that. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's all I can say. Hi guys, my name is Alan also. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my name's Ron. <laughs> and the reason I said that is because mirror image. I also grew up in a Catholic church and uh, same thing, you know, our father walked in heaven. I mean, you'd go and you'd say the same thing you repeat and they'd repeat back and it was just something you did, you know, and I knew there was a God, but I didn't have a relationship with him. And uh, it wasn't until I was 19 years old and I lost my dad. And two years later, I lost my mom. And I'm going to get real with you guys. I hated God. I didn't like God at all. I blamed God for my parents for taking them from me and leaving me alone. Now, I had two older brothers, and they had been married and had kids, and they were on their own and stuff, and they even wanted to live with me in my house. I had this big house all to myself, and I was like, no, go. I, I can do this. I can handle this, you know? And, but it didn't involve God. It involved drinking and partying, and yes, I'm going to say drugs, because this is where I get it all out. And... Um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't pretty, and that was my life before Jesus. And come to find out, you know, I was mad because my dad died, because he was my best friend, and come to find out, he was given six months to live the day I was born. But yet he lasted 18 years to, for me to get to know him, for me to grow up, for me to graduate, for him to see me graduate and walk down the aisle, and just a couple years later, I lost them. But, you know, I didn't know that then. But see, that, that's a sign from God that we don't know. You know, that, that's the way I look at it. And the same thing with my mom. But, you know, I would lay in bed at night, and the party wouldn't end. My friends are all out, and I had the house that had the party. And I'm laying in bed, and I ran out of money, so I couldn't go buy more, you know what, drugs or whatever, or booze or whatever. And one night, I'm in Fort Lauderdale at a nightclub dancing and having a good time. Four hours later, I wake up in Opalaka, which is far from Fort Lauderdale, and uh, in the bathroom, and uh, started crying. You know, first of all, I didn't know how I got home. I drove home, and it was a miracle. I didn't kill somebody or kill myself. And, uh, but that night, I cried myself all night, and that's when I accepted Jesus. That's when I knew who Jesus was. And it was that, at that moment, that I said to myself, this is when I'm going to take this and I'm going to do good because that's what God does. You know, he takes an experience that you have and unfortunately you got to go through it to be able to learn, right? But that's why I had to be part of you guys because I was saved later in life. But I love how you guys are so young and you know about Jesus right now. I mean, from little and I just became a grandpa and I have a little grandbaby. And that's the first thing I'm going to do is teach her about Jesus, because without him, we're nothing. Thank you. Those are some amazing stories. And like I said, they were all different. Every single one of you came to know God through, through different ways, through religious upbringings or not, through um, just looking for that love and acceptance, through making your faith your own. Um, through bad circumstances, that became good. Um, but all of those things, each of you decided at some point that you were going to put your full faith in Jesus, and he brought you through those different circumstances. And 
that leads into kind of the second part of tonight, which is talking about what is faith. Now, faith, in its its most basic sense, means trust, but it's really not all that simple. In Hebrews 11.1, it says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not just jumping off of a cliff with nothing to fall on at all. Jesus and God gives us a really firm foundation that we can base our faith on. And there are three basic things that he gives us for that. The first is the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Now, I said faith is trust, and trust is something that is built up over time, built up over proven consistency. And God has had a lot of time and a lot of examples that prove that he is exactly who he says he is, that prove that he is faithful. We have the Bible, the word of God, that's an entire book of evidence that he is who he says he is, that we can put our faith in him. It is an entire book of stories, of history, of examples, of miracles that show us exactly why we can trust him, that show us his character. The second is the work of Jesus. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And then John 19.30, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. The work is finished. We can have faith in our salvation and faith in God because it's, it's done. It's been taken care of. There is nothing that you can do or not do because those wages were already paid by Jesus on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You can have faith in your salvation because it is not dependent on anything that you do or don't do. And thank God our salvation is not dependent on ourselves because we are flawed and we would all be in a lot of trouble if that was the case. Instead, our salvation is based on Jesus who is perfect, who already did the work, and who already took our place on the cross for us. All we have to do is believe it, accept him, and choose to follow him. And the third thing that we can base our faith on is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.16 says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit because we are, that we are God's children. So remember a couple weeks ago, Lewis's example with the cake. Um, we know that that cake was good because some of you got to taste it, experience it. Um, in the same way, we know that God is good because we experience him. So another quick example. If I were to take my mic pack and drop it, I'm not going to. I see the panic already. I promise you guys I'm not actually going to do it. If I did, it would fall. Why? Gravity. Exactly. So can you actually like physically see? Now I messed it up, the wire. It's going to sit here now. Um, Can you guys actually physically see the gravitational forces on this stage? No. But do you question if it's there? No. You know gravity exists. It's not a question in our minds. Because you can see the impacts of it. You can see what it does. The same thing with the Holy Spirit. You can't physically see the Holy Spirit next to you. You don't know what it looks like. But you have faith that it's there because you experience it, because you can see the impact of it in your life. And that could be... In a lot of different ways, that can be through circumstances, that can be through situations, it can be, maybe it's something that you're doing that you never thought you'd be able to do. Maybe it's the way timing worked out, or God placing a certain person in your life, or working out a bad circumstance for good. It can be anything. I know there's so many situations in my life just like that, that I'm, I know that there is no explanation for how that worked out other than God. And those can be big things, those can be small things. Or maybe you're thinking, I haven't really had anything like that yet. It might be something that's just more internal. It could be the Holy Spirit influencing and transforming your heart. It could be changing just the way you think, the way you see things, the way you think. You can see the evidence of the Holy Spirit all around you, and that's just another one of the things that you can base your faith on. Now, having faith does not mean that it's never going to be tested. 
It doesn't make you a bad Christian if you have moments where you have doubts or where you're scared or where you have questions. But what's important is that in those hard moments, you remember those foundations, you remember what God has done in your life and the lives of others, and you turn back to him for strength because you know that he's got it and you know that he knows what's best. Now, there are a lot of really good examples in the Bible of people who had really strong faith. And one of the best places is in Hebrews 11. It's known as the Hall of Faith. And it gives a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really crazy things in the name of faith. People like Noah, who built an ark in the middle of the desert, or Abraham, who was willing to sacrifice his son, um, Moses, who stood up for the Israelites in Egypt. All of these things, in the mildest case, could make people maybe look at them a little bit weird. For some of them, it could have even gotten them killed. But they did it anyway. They took those steps out in faith because they knew who created them and they knew who created those steps because they trusted in God. And there are still things like that happening today, like with our panelists. So can you all tell us about a time that you really had to have faith and trust in God? I guess I'll start again. Um, <laughs> I want. It was when COVID first started, getting the two weeks off, getting the extra week off, and then getting the the email or the phone call that we had to stay home. I was really. I was. I'm telling you, I was so worried that I wasn't gonna go back. I was worried I wasn't gonna be able to see my friends again because I had to switch schools. I was switching from and. I was switching from schools with Victoria to a completely new school. So I was worried I wasn't going to be able to see some of those friends again. And I really had to like trust that I would. Just I had to trust that this COVID thing was going to end, obviously. It's still here. But I had to trust that there was going to be a time that I was going to be able to go back, say bye, and just be happy where I was. And then moving to that new school, obviously still online, it sucked to be at home. You had to get up early anyways, open the laptop, and sit there quietly. <laughs> like, there was nothing to do. You were on mute the whole time. And I had to trust that I was going to be OK, because I hated it. To unmute and to say here, absolutely not. <laughs> to unmute and to read, please, no. I didn't want to. I had an excuse for the whole thing. And just to have faith that I was going to be OK, and, everyone was gonna be able to get through it, so. Okay, so for me, um, my faith was tested like right when I like accept, like I started following Jesus. And like I believe I always had the Holy Spirit but like when I started following Jesus, then the Holy Spirit like started talking and just revealed like so many plans, you know, like I, I've seen where that happens to like different followers of Christ. Like once you start following and then you're like, Jesus, use me, like he starts talking. So there was there was one particular moment when I felt like he told me that he was going to do something like in my life. And I was like, oh my gosh, so cool, like, oh my gosh. Um, but so as a human being, if, if I'm thinking, oh, God's going to do this really cool thing in my life, and it's actually like a heart's desire, I'm like, okay, like, uh, when's like the quickest time that we can get this done? And, but it didn't happen in my time, you know? I was 20 years old, and I'm 22 right now, so two years later, and... The, the thing that I feel like the Lord told me that was going to happen in my life did not happen yet. And I, my faith was really tested in that because I started to think, oh, God's a liar. Like, I, like, I didn't want to feel like that, but I started to get angry because I'm like, why would you play with my heart like that? Do you, know, do you guys know that commercial, like, with the, um, the, this guy with a fishing rod and the dollar? And then he puts it down, and then he moves it out of the way. Like, last minute, he's like, got to be quicker than that. That's how I felt. That's literally how I felt. 
um, like when it came down to the promise that the Lord gave me. Um, but it turns out he was teaching me a lesson through that. He was teaching me that, like, no, I'm not messing with your heart. I'm actually going to bring this promise about, but I know more than you do, and I'm gonna bring it about in my timing and not your timing because you don't know as much. So I really had to have, that really grew my faith a lot because when you don't see anything happening, like you know that you know that you know that you heard God, and then you don't see anything happening. It really stretches your faith. And it really shows you that regardless of my circumstance, like God is still for me, you know? Like during those times of testing, that's when I've gotten like the most comfort. So, so yes, that's what, so that promise that the Lord gave me, like that was the time of testing, yeah. For me. <laughs> um, I feel like for me, a time where I had to truly trust in God and commit to my faith was when my uncle passed away. Um, he wasn't like a truly righteous person, didn't always do the right thing, but from the moment that everything started with his passing up until he was um, buried, I was continuously praying, asking God for a sign, and I felt like I wasn't getting anything back. Um, and it took a while throughout that time, which felt like forever, um, until after we ended up back at my grandma's house where he lived, and I remember it was like a really cloudy, rainy day, and I just remember continuously praying and praying, and I felt like this was a confirmation from God that everything would be okay and go according to God's plan. So not necessarily my prayer would be answered, but that I just needed to trust in God. And the symbol that I took it as was uh, there was a rainbow in the sky, and the rainbow is you know, a symbol of God's mercy and his love for us. So for me, it was just a symbol from him that everything would be okay. And that's just one of my stories of when I had to have faith in God's plan and God's timing for everything. Well, I'm the old guy, so I've had a bunch of them. I can't even, there's so many, because God's amazing. But the one that I really enjoyed is this past year with COVID, or year and a half, almost two, right? Two years now? Where everything shut down, and the church shut down. We closed all the doors, and uh, I was like, what are we going to do? You know, we didn't know if we'd have jobs. We didn't know if we were going to go home, if there was going to ever be a church again. It, it was scary. And... Um, you know, thank God we had a strong online presence, and we just continued online, and uh, we continued, you know, worshiping the people and, you know, ministering, and it was amazing. It did, like, it didn't quit, and we still had followers. And then, you know, one day we're brainstorming, we're talking, you know, how can we do this? How can we come up with, you know, and, and the devil thought he had won, and he did not, because we came up with drive, the drive-in church, okay? So we build a stage out front, and we start playing out front. We didn't know if anybody would come. In the first week, we might have had like 10 cars or whatever. But then the, the next week, we had like 30. And then, you know, I had to open up more parking spaces. And it was just amazing. And God's sense of humor is something as annoying as a car horn, beep, 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 became amen. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. We hear God speak in so many different ways through speaking to you, through a rainbow, through a car horn, through so many different things. And I think that's what's so cool about faith is that through, through any circumstance, it can get you through it if you just have faith in him. And I am not saying that is easy because it is not. But it is possible and God can get us through anything if we just choose to put our trust in him. 
And I think everything that we've talked about is wrapped up really well in one verse, and that's Hebrews 11:6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If you remember anything from all of this, to summarize, it is, in order to be a Christian, you have to have faith. In order to have faith, you have to seek God. You can't trust someone that you don't know. So it's important that we are spending intentional time growing closer to him. And if you feel like tonight that you are ready to pursue him, to grow closer to him, to begin your relationship with God and take that step out in faith, I want to lead you in a prayer. So if we could just everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. Don't look around. Don't think about the people around you because it's not about anyone else right now. It is about your relationship with God. It's just between you and him. And you can say this out loud. You can say this just in your heart. It doesn't matter because he's going to hear it either way. So if you would like to say this prayer. God, thank you for who you are. God, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I have messed up. But I know that you sent your son to die on the cross in my place and to pay for those sins. God, I thank you for your love And I choose now to follow you for the rest of my life and for eternity. God, I ask you to come into my heart to guide me and that you will strengthen my faith and help me to see how to follow you. Lord, I love you. And thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. That teaching was so awesome. We hope you guys enjoyed it. We want to make sure to remind you guys to make sure you like, comment, and subscribe because there's tons and tons of great content on our student page. We also want to let you guys know that if you want any more information about Oasis students and Oasis Church, make sure you guys visit oasis.org slash Oasis students for any information you guys may need. And we hope to see you guys soon in the future.